Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Meredith Miller, and I'm the Senior Vice President for Trade, Energy, and Economic Affairs. Is this on? Thanks, Kimi. At the National Bureau of Asian Research. Um, on behalf of the NBR team, I want to welcome you all here. Um, it's a real treat for us to have the opportunity to speak with you all today and to be here at Waseda University. Uh, our institution, the National Bureau of Asian Research, was founded in the memory of Senator Henry M. Jackson from Washington State to build bridges between policymakers and the academic community. Senator Jackson was a foreign policy throughout his career in the U.S. Congress, and he firmly believed in the importance of Asia to the United States' long-term interests. Our founding president, Ken Pyle, is a leading expert on Japan and the United States. And thanks to Professor Pyle, close collaboration with Japanese institutions and thought leaders has been an enduring characteristic of NBR from our very, very earliest days. So it's a pleasure to be at an institution, Waseda University, that has such a similar outlook in terms of valuing the close collaboration and exchange between academics and policymakers. Waseda is well known for its role in fostering the next generation of Japan's leaders and for the policy-oriented outlook that was present at its founding by former Prime Minister Okuma. We have a terrific program for you this morning. Ah, thank you. We have a terrific program for you this morning that really brings together those two arenas, the policymaking and the expert community. Our opening speaker this morning, the Honorable Taro Kono, is well known for his leadership in Japan. And our closing speaker, Admiral Dennis Blair, has also had a very distinguished career in public service in the United States. Um, we have a panel today that's featuring two of the leading experts on energy geopolitics in the US-Japan, um, Mike Herberg from NBR and Soichi Ito from the Institute of Energy Economics of Japan. Um, what we're going to do today is share with you our thoughts and insights um, and perspectives on the central themes around a new initiative that NBR has begun adapting to a new energy era, strengthening U.S.-Japan ties. This initiative was started with the very generous support of the Sasakawa Peace Foundation, and our aim is to research a new energy and strategic policy framework for the Asia-Pacific in light of four dramatic factors that are now taking place. Uh, the first is a resurgence of the U.S. as a major energy producer, thanks to the energy revolution there. The second, Asia's growing dependence on Middle East oil and gas. The third, the U.S. strategic rebalance towards Asia. And fourth, growing pressures in the United States to reduce our strategic commitments in the Gulf. Our aim today and throughout this project is to explore ways that the U.S. and Japan and other Asian powers can work together to form a more collaborative approach to energy security in the Asia-Pacific region. We're very grateful to the U.S.-Japan Research Institute for partnering with us and giving us the opportunity today to speak with all of you. Um, as you all may well know, USJI is a consortium of the eight top universities in Tokyo. Um, and for a US-based institution like NBR, they're a wonderful resource as we seek to access the best expertise in the field on a whole range of issues. Um, it's been our great pleasure to partner with them on several programs and initiatives in Washington, DC. Um, today is our inaugural partnership in Tokyo, um, and we're very excited about it and look forward to many more fruitful collaborations with USJI. I'd now like to introduce our co-host today, um, the president of the US-Japan Research in Institution, Katsuichi Uchida. In addition to his leadership as president of USJI, Uchida-sensei is a professor at the School of International Liberal Studies here at Waseda and vice president for international affairs. He's been a leader in promoting greater academic exchange between the U.S. and Japan, and it's my pleasure to welcome him to the podium. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mira-san, uh, for your uh, very kind introductions. Uh, good morning, uh, the Honorable uh, Mr. Taro Kono, a member of the Diet, distinguished guest, Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the National Bureau of Asian Institute, Asian Research, and U.S.-Japan Research Institute co-hosted seminars on adapting to a new energy era, strengthening U.S.-Japan ties. 
at this Okuma uh, Memorial Towers. I'm Katsuichi Uchida, uh, president of the USJR, and also the uh, vice president of Waseda University. As you may know, uh, USJR is a non-profit research institute in Washington, D.C., organized by eight leading Japanese universities and financially supported by uh, business societies, both uh, United States and Japan. The mission of USJR is to dispatch policy-related research results to a wider communities by the medium of English. Uh, USJR organizes a few research teams, consists of researchers from not only at Japanese universities, but also US institutions. And they uh, publish research results and hold seminars. And USJR usually hold a week-long seminars in March and September in Washington, D.C. The next USJR uh, week will be held from 24th to 28th of this February in Washington, D.C. And I would uh, like to welcome all of you uh, 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 if you are uh, staying in Washington, D.C. And uh, also, the USGI uh, had uh, occasional seminars, one or twice, once or twice a m uh, month, and sometimes called symposiums in Japan. For example, last December, uh, USGI held a symposium on US-Japan security issue. Uh, received uh, more than 400 uh, participants. And uh, recently, from March last year, USJI started uh, the uh, seminar called uh, Japan 101 series uh, with uh, US uh, Asia Institute and also NBR to discuss urgent social, economic, and political issues uh, of current Japan. And the purpose is in order to provide useful inf information to people in the capital hill. And because of collaborations with NBR in these days, we are very fortunate and uh, we are very pleased to collaborate with NBR to jointly host today's seminar. However, uh, we are very sorry for not able to uh, nominate especially to the seminars. Uh, middle of February is the worst season for Japanese academies because uh, the faculty members are very busy for marking examination paper of undergraduate students <laughs> and hold committees uh, to evaluate to ass and assess master thesis of master students and also to prepare for an entrance examination of a university. Although we identified several specialists, However, because of these uh, conditions, they are not able to participate today. On behalf of USJI, I would like to express my sincere apology for this. And also, uh, today, Vasta University has entrance examination of the School of International Liberal Studies, so we cannot provide a venue for this inside the campus. I also need to apologize on behalf of Waseda University. As the uh, uh, Japanese uh, well, speech uh, usually begin with apologies, so I, I, uh, I follow the traditions of Japanese speech. Uh, anyway, however, uh, today's topic is very important for the future of US-Japan relations. So I'm very pleased to see many audience in this venue. I'm quite sure today's discussion will be very, very stimulating and will produce fruitful and productive results once again. Thank you very much for your participation. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Chida Sensei. And it's it's wonderful to see such great turnout in the midst of a very intense period in the academic arena uh, here in Tokyo. And we're adding our, our good wishes to all the students who are sitting in their entrance exam right now close by this room. Um, it's now my great pleasure to introduce to you our opening speaker, um, the Honorable Taro Kono, uh, I think who is well known to many of you for his leadership uh, here in Japan. He's in his sixth term in the Diet as a Liberal Democratic Party member. And during his service, he's held several important and influential positions within the Diet, 
uh, including as chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee, as senior vice minister of justice, and as parliamentary sec uh, secretary for public management, among others. Um, I first had the pleasure of meeting Kono Sensei uh, last year when he was in Washington, D.C., um, and we had a, a private briefing in the Senate Foreign Relations Committee that was chaired by Admiral Fargo, uh, NDR's Shali Kashbili Chair for Security Studies. Uh, and in that exchange, uh, Kono Sensei shared some of his, his insights on Japan's strategic outlook, um, and we're really thrilled that he could be here with us today to begin our discussion. Um, we've asked him to draw on his, his deep expertise of not only Japan's foreign policy outlook and policymaking apparatus, but also um, in the U.S. he has experience working um, in our own Congress. Uh, he, he worked for uh, Congressman Richard Selby of Alabama, so I think he, he knows the U.S. system very well, um, and as such is very well placed to, to share with us his thoughts not only on the outlook, but on ways that the U.S. and Japan can collaborate together more effectively on energy security. So with that uh, brief introduction, please join me, me in welcoming uh, Kono Sensei to the, to the stage. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you so much. Good morning. Um, my name is Taro Kono, and uh, obviously the parliament has nothing to do with the entrance exam. And, uh, <laughs> I was free this morning, so I was uh, honored to be here to speak about uh, energy, Japan's energy strategy. Um, I thought it will take about two hours, but the uh, time allocated for my talk is about 20 minutes. So I have to limit uh, four era area that are I'm going to talk in 20 minutes. Um, there are several things that w U.S. and Japan uh, share the concern in the energy field. Um, I un identify the reprocessing on plutonium. Um, the President Obama is uh, going to the Hague in, I think, March to talk about the plutonium issue in the uh, Nuclear Security Summit. And uh, shale gas, shale gas is coming to Japan finally probably 2016, 2017, and uh, smart grid renewable. And then the lastly, the United States commitment to the Middle East around 2030. So could you do the slide? Um, we have very s different nuclear strategy from any other country. In any other country in the world, uh, you burn plutonium uranium fuel in a uh, reactor and you get the power and uh, you throw out the spent fuel and replace with new one. I mean, where you're gonna put the spent fuel afterwards is a major issue in any country, but the mostly uh, that's it. When you talk about the nuclear power, that's what they're talking about. But in Japan, because we don't produce any crude oil and we don't produce any uranium, if we just stop at the spent fuel, it's the same as uh, oil generation. So we went further than that. Uh, we, got, we negotiated with the U.S. government under President Carter and President Ford, and uh, we got the right to reprocess spent fuel. If you reprocess spent fuel, you get the plutonium, and then you're supposed to feed the plutonium into a fast breeder reactor. And then it will multiply uh, plutonium and uh, generate power at the same time. So if we complete this process for next 2,000 years, we can go sort of electricity self-sufficient self in Japan. That was the whole idea. Uh, but what's, what's happening is the fast breeder reactor was supposed to be commercially available by the second half of 1980. 1980. That was the original plan. But uh, as you know, we got uh, our pilot plant, Monju, uh, got a major accident in 1995, and the uh, situation hasn't changed. Even the most optimistic government uh, estimate we will not be able to get the commercially viable fast breeder reactor before 2050. So after 50 years and after spending 
zillions of yen, um, the fast breeder reactor will probably not going to materialize. That's fair to say. So you, can, uh, you can skip that one. So the problem we have is we have asked UK and France to reprocess our spent fuel from the beginning, uh, even before we, get, we got the negotiation done with the United States. So right now, uh, Japan has 45 tons of plutonium, 10 tons of which has already back in Japan. 35 tons are coming back from UK and France eventually. But we will not going to have fast reader reactor. Then what we're going to do with the plutonium? Oh, by the way, I heard the United States Armed Forces have 38 tons of plutonium on top of their nuclear warhead. So what we have, 45 ton, is larger than what U.S. military service have. Uh, North Korea has 50 kilograms of plutonium, and we have six body talks. So with 45 tons of plutonium, we'll probably need to have 6,000 party talks. But uh, then what we're going to do is a problem. And uh, please. Another issue is we are going to restart a nuclear reactor um, sometime, uh, but spent fuel will go into overflow the spent fuel pool. Uh, if we restart, uh, say, Genkai nuclear power plant in Kyushu, in three years, its spent fuel pool will be filled up. Then what are we going to do? If you ask the power companies, they say, casually, you know, we're going to reprocess spent fuel. Don't worry about it. They will take care of the spent fuel problem. Yes, spent fuel will be taken care of if you reprocess it in Aomori Prefecture, in Rokasho. But then 1% of spent fuel comes out as plutonium. That means every year we will produce 8 tons plutonium on top of 45 tons. And then the Monju or fast breeder reactor will not be ready for another, I don't know, at least 50 years. So we're going to have a serious plutonium problem. And that is one of the U.S. concern. Um, Mr. Richard Armitage has told me about this because now South Korea wants to reprocess their spent fuel. South Africa wants to reprocess their spent fuel. If South Korea, South Africa start doing this, probably any other country wants to reprocess. Then we're going to have so many countries having plutonium, and you only need 8 kilo of plutonium to create a nuclear weapon. And how we're going to deal with this is a major issue. Uh, you can skip a couple. Another one, another one. Yes, thank you. Um, Right now, even LDP, my party, which has promoted the nuclear policy in Japan, sort of internally agree it will be very difficult to build the new nuclear reactors. So if we are not going to add any more nuclear reactors, and if we decide uh, to decommission any reactor after 40 years, uh, this is what it would look like. The blue line is before Fukushima. Uh, the red line is after Fukushima, we lost uh, several, and we're probably not going to restart several more nuclear reactors. So by around 2050, uh, Japan will go nuclear free. And this is, I think, feasible time frame. Please. So in the future, it will look like this. Uh, Right now, we heavily depend on the fossil fuel plus nuclear. Well, nuclear at uh, its, its height of the nuclear power in Japan, it only produced uh, less than 30% of our electricity. So we will have to manage to produce 70% uh, of electricity outside of nuclear anyway. And we're going to reduce the dependency on the nuclear power. So we need to do several things. One, we need to maximize efficiency. We need to decrease the use of electricity in 
good way. Uh, after the after the March 11, uh, we did a lot of hard stuff, but that is not a uh, feasible. That is not a uh, we we don't keep it that way for many years. So we need to use technology to maximize efficiency so that we will use less electricity to sustain uh, industry and everyday life. And I think we should be able to manage that. And then we need to increase the renewables. We have, uh, we have put in a uh, fit-in tariff uh, since 2011, and uh, it's, it's helping to increase the renewable in this country. And uh, hopefully, we will catch up Germany um, in some time. So the first thing we need to do is maximize efficiency. Then we will increase the renewable. And then we will have to decrease dependency on nuclear, as well as coal and uh, crude oil. So by 2050, uh, if, if you are optimist, you would say we can manage without any nuclear or fossil fuel. If we are not able to do that, we'll probably have to depend on the natural gas to fill the gap. The problem we have for natural gas is we buy at the very high price from the Middle East. So importing shale from the United States would put uh, downward pressure on those price. And uh, that, is, that would give us some bargaining power vis-a-vis -vis Middle East. And we definitely should talk to Russia about getting the pipeline from Sahalin to Hokkaido. Uh, if we get the gas pipeline, we, don't need, we can just uh, import shale or natural gas as a form of gas, which is much cheaper. What's stopping that is the Northern Territory issues. But uh, Mr. Abe has met, ha have s has seen uh, President Putin for five times now. And uh, we are expecting uh, things would move forward. And uh, hopefully, uh, we should be able to make some kind of compromise on Northern Ireland. No one get four, but no one should get zero. So it's compromise somewhere between two and three, between two and three, yeah. So we can get shale from the United States. If we get uh, gas pipeline from Russia, we get uh, some alternative to the Middle East. Um, can you go back to the one, the first one? Thank you. Uh, you can go back all the way to the number one. Another one, yeah, thank you. Uh, let me let me skip the smart grid thing and uh, go back to the last one. Well, the another issue that we are concerned is how much United States uh, be committed to the Middle East. Say 2030. Uh, Ten years ago, uh, 15 years ago, a lot of people thought the U.S. will start importing a lot of gas and oil from the Middle East. U.S. dependency on the Middle East will be one of the problem for U.S. security issues. And uh, that's why the, on the Mexican Gulf, they have built a lot of import terminal. But for the last 10 years, things has turned around. The U.S. is now producing a lot of uh, shale gas, and they don't need to import uh, natural gas from the Middle East, and they probably don't have to import much. So by 2030, the United States will be net exporter of gas and oil. So the import terminal on the Gulf is going to be used as an export terminal for Japan. If you look at the uh, U.S. government deficit, and they will definitely have to deal with the government deficit. Uh, the President Obama and the uh, Republican Party have made some kind of compromise, and it's going well this year. But they will have to have uh, some kind of cut in uh, defense spending. And then if U.S. dependency on the Middle East will be going down, and by 2030 it will be almost zero, then what we worried about is will the United States be committed to the Middle East like today in 2030? Because by 2030, China and India will be depending on the Middle East much more than today. 
China is now building pipeline through Burma, the Myanmar, and they are building another one in Pakistan. So if something happens to the Strait of Malacca, they don't have to worry about it. All they have to do is go to the seaport of Myanmar or Pakistan and use pipeline to get the gas and oil into China. And they are getting ready for that. And uh, India will be also depending on uh, gas and oil from the Middle East by 2030. And uh, Japan and Korea will be also depending on the Middle East at some rate. So if U.S. is decided to weaken the commitment to the Middle East, it would be China's blue water navy that will come around the Indian Ocean to deal with the sea lanes. And that is not a tolerable situation for Japan. So we need to get U.S. committed with U.S.-Japan alliance and U.S. basis in Japan so that the uh, supply of energy to the East Asia will be protected with U.S. forces, with allies. And that's something we need to look at. It. And uh, going back to the smart grid, well, we have very corrupted power industry. I should say it was corruption that created the uh, problem in Fukushima. And uh, we're going to uh, make the power industry as a regular industry by liberalizing that industry. Plus, we're going to create a current captive grid uh, into independent grid by 2020, maybe. So if we do that, I think we will open up the market to a lot of renewable, independent renewable operator to uh, produce uh, electricity and supply to independent grid. And we need to introduce uh, smart grid technology to our electricity supply. And uh, if you look at the U.S. market, I think they are way ahead in that technology. So we need to cooperate in the smart grid renewable uh, energy technology, and we need to catch up Germany. So these four, well, there are a lot more if we got a time, but uh, we need to deal with the plutonium issue. Japan need to stop reprocessing because it's not economically feasible and we cannot deal with the plutonium that we have. So we need to probably renegotiate uh, US-Japan nuclear pact. I think it will be up for re uh, renegotiation soon. And uh, we need to stop reprocessing so that we can stop sort of uh, every other country having plutonium uh, in their country. And uh, we will continue to deal with the natural gas, shale and uh, pipeline from Russia and uh, smart grid technology. And we also need to uh, get the U.S. committed to the Middle East into the foreseeable future. And the U.S.-Japan alliance will be one of the uh, cornerstone to keep it that way. So my time is running out. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, I'm happy to take your comment and questions. Thank you. view of um, some of the actions that are underway here in Japan to um, diversify energy resources and also alleviate the really terrific economic pressure that Japan is under in terms of importing large quantities of LNG. Um, we can take questions from the audience. I just ask that you introduce yourselves uh, first. Um, why don't we start with the gentleman here in the front row? Thank you. <laughs> Hi, uh, uh, Paul Scalise, University of uh, Tokyo. Um, just two very uh, quick questions. My understanding from talking to Total, the French LNG company, is that the hubs for LNG, uh, both within uh, Japan for the utility companies and for the United States and probably even Canada, are now operating at 100% capacity. And as a result, 
you're going to need to build more hubs. Uh, when I ask the utility companies in Japan, everyone just kind of shrugs their shoulders and they don't really have a clear idea when this is going to happen. But do you have any sense yourself um, if this happens to be true, that they are operating at 100% capacity and if there's going to be any government monies to actually fund the construction of new hubs and so forth, working with the utility companies, either in Japan uh, or the United States for that matter, for the U.S. Uh, export problem of shale and, and conventional gas. That's the first question. Second question is, as you know, worldwide electricity prices just keep going up, both in liberalized markets and unliberalized markets. Um, is the objective now to liberalize markets in Japan with the belief that electricity prices will fall, or is it the belief that you will liberalize markets so that renewable energy will have a larger market share? Which do you think that will be? Thank you. Um, Hub, I need to look look into it. Uh, we have invited a lot of gas companies, power companies to LDP headquarters to talk about it, and no one has raised the issue about the Hub, so I will look into it. Um, liberalizing the market, we need to stop corruption in the industry. That's the number one. Um, number two, um, we expect the price to fall. Right now, it's a sort of a fixed price, and uh, they don't really have to care about the cost. So we we are hoping the electricity price will go down. But uh, as you increase a renewable, you have to pay for the fit. So total cost may go up, but uh, I think it is important for us to promote a renewable before fossil price will start shooting up. So that's something we have to pay for. But uh, we're expecting, we have looked at the British market and uh, it went down. Beca and uh, because of the oil price went up, uh, the electricity price went up too. But that, that would happen in the current system as well. So we are expecting the price to go down. Before we go back out to the audience, if I could exercise the mar moderator's prerogative of asking a question. Um, I wanted to follow up on your comments on the Middle East and the, the strength of the U.S. commitment there. Um, one thing that's come out of our, our discussions in this project thus far, and, and Admiral Blair is, is really the expert on this, is that there's unlikely to be a serious dis dis diminishment of the U.S. commitment to sea lane security. But the more challenging issue is given the political volatility of the Middle East and the lack of appetite in the U.S. that exists now for direct intervention, as we saw play out from the Syria crisis, um, that that is a tremendous vulnerability for Asia, which is so heavily import dependent on the Middle East. And I, I was wondering if, in your view, there's scope for enhanced collaboration between the U.S. and Japan on promoting good governance or um, strengthening the prospects for greater political stability in the Gulf region. Yes, um, that's that's a problem. I mean, we have seen the Arab Spring, but uh, what has come out is Egypt going back to the old days, Syria's in problem, and if President Assad goes, we don't know who's going to take over. And the President Saddam Hussein went down, and it's kind of mess. So I don't know if it was better or worse. So it is very difficult what to to say what we should uh, give priority should we give priority to democracy freedom or stability or our strategic objective over their what they want so i think it's it's debatable and uh, well it's it's good to hear that us will keep committed to the middle east but then the stability of the middle east how are we going to increase it and uh, I think Japan should be more involved in the uh, Middle East peace process. Uh, we are sort of religion free. We don't have many Jewish people. We don't have not many Muslim people. The Christian popularity in Japan is very small. So we can go in as an honest broker. We don't sell a weapon system. We don't have a history of uh, colonies in the Middle East. 
So Japan can be seen as an honest broker in the Middle East peace process. And I think we should be more committed politically to that region. Um, we had a question right here in the middle. Yes, so hello, my name is Alex Luta. I'm from the Tokyo Institute of Technology. I have a very simple question. Um, I'm looking at uh, the numbers right now from Shigen NHO about electricity consumption in Japan. And from 1990 to 2010, so before Fukushima, electricity consumption went up by 32.7%. These are your government statistics. Now, uh, you, s you showed on a slide that show in it, uh, so uh, cutting electricity or energy consumption was going to cut uh, consumption of electricity in Japan by 2050 by 50%. Uh, how do you intend to pay for this? Uh, under the DPJ government, uh, there was a program called EcoPoints, and it was very successful as far as I understand, but uh, it ran out of money. It cost too much to support the diffusion of uh, appliances that would support show in, in household consumption. And uh, this is not even addressing industry. So when it comes to the LDP government, uh, what is your vision for achieving these um, show in a uh, you know, goals, given that consumption keeps on rising for the past 20 years? Thank you. Well, we are, we are now losing population pretty fast. And uh, a lot of power companies still forecast uh, electricity consumption will go up but uh, well since Fukushima it has actually come down and uh, we will have more technology to reduce their electricity consumption like look at uh, light bulbs if we change to LED and things like that we can reduce it uh, if we change all the light bulbs to LED it will take 9% off of the electricity consumption uh, can't do that this year or next year, but if we spend some years, all the light bulbs that went out will be replaced with LD, LED, things like that. It will take time. And plus, the fossil fuel price will go up anyway. Uh, it would be better to give some kind of subsidy to give incentive to change uh, uh, equipment or introduce a new system, even if it costs a little bit more. Um, we, we need to set the goal, we need to set the target by say 2030, 2040, 2050. And then we can come up with uh, each policy, what need to be done to achieve the target and how much the government should pay, how much you should pay to save the electricity. So we, I think we are now debating within the party and now, now we are saying we need to have some kind of set target for the renewable. And then we will come up how much we're going to spend uh, by whom. Uh, right now, we're still in debating. But uh, if we don't do nothing, the fossil fuel costs will go up, and you have to pay more. So it makes sense to pay some to introduce more renewable and maximize efficiency. Time for one more question. I'm Masahiko Sasajima from the Yomi Shimbun newspaper. Um, Mr. Kono, you refer to the, the compromise between uh, Russia and Japan in terms of uh, Northern Ireland and the energy pipelines. Uh, and also you refer to the, the number of the, the Northern Ireland, two or three. Uh, does it mean that uh, you want to co compromise to renounce one or two islands as for the Northern Ireland issues, could you clarify your idea? Well, if you keep saying four islands back for 200 years and the uh, color of the map changes, everything comes back to Japan, I would, I would do that. But if you look at the Russian situation, it has become democracy and it has democratic parliament, well, sort of. And uh, even if President Putin signed the treaty, it needs to be ratified. So if you wait longer, the chances are you're going to get nothing back. So I think it's time to, time to be more realistic. If a politician say, we want four islands back, 
he's safe. No one's going to shoot him from the behind. But you're not going to get anything done at the end of the day. So it's time for politicians to say, well, we need to be more realistic. Well, hopefully, if we get 50-50, that would be great. Uh, if we get the three islands back, that's fine. Even if we don't get only two, still better than nothing. So I think we need to stand up and say, well, it's time to be more realistic. And let's get it over. And uh, there's a lot of things we can work with Russia for national interest of both country. And uh, I, I think if the Northern Ireland is a showstopper, I think we need to get rid of it. And say thank you very much for sharing your insights and your pragmatism thank with you. us this morning. We really appreciate it. Um, please join me in thanking our opening speaker. Thank you very much. So Mike just reminded me, it's our first and only panel <laughs> today. We've had a lot of programs lately. Um, thank you all again for coming. Uh, we have two terrific speakers uh, for you here this morning. As I mentioned earlier, two of the top people on energy geopolitics um, from Japan and the United States. I'm just going to briefly introduce them before we uh, get into the discussion. I've asked both of them to keep their remarks to 10 minutes, so we have plenty of time for exchange with all of you. Um, Mike Herberg is going to kick things off. Mike is the Energy Security Research Director at the National Bureau of Asian Research. Uh, he founded that program. This year is our 10th anniversary, um, and it's gone by very quickly. <laughs> um, Mike is uh, also a senior lecturer at the University of California, San Diego. He has over 20 years of experience in the industry from his time at ARCO in various positions related to strategic planning. So he's got a good understanding of how energy markets work and also a deep expertise in both uh, U.S. and Asian politics. So he's able to bring those two together to usually provide and always provide some very terrifically interesting insights into how these uh, two sides of the same coin uh, come together to affect the security and economic outlook of all the countries in the region. Mike is going to start out by providing an overview of the key questions that we're looking at in this initiative. Um, we'll then be turning over to Soichi Ito, who's a longtime collaborator and friend of NBR. Uh, Soichi is a senior analyst uh, for the Global Energy Group Strategy and Industry Research Unit at the Institute of Energy Economics of Japan. Uh, he has tremendously deep expertise, not only in uh, Japan's energy outlook, um, but also Northeast Asia and Russia in particular. Um, Soichi also has deep ties to the U.S. and a fondness for Seattle. So since that's where our headquarters is, um, we're always especially happy to find opportunities to bring him to the West Coast. Um, Soichi is going to help uh, provide some context on the Japanese perspective on these questions and also ways uh, that the U.S. and Japan might collaborate together more effectively. Um, so with that, I'll turn things over to Mike. And Mike is going to head up to the podium. <laughs> I'm working from my laptop here, so I uh, stand up a little easier than Doug when the mic is in the laptop, sitting in the in the chair. Is that uh, is that working okay? Thank you for that kind introduction there. I appreciate that. Uh, and it's good to be back at Waseda. I was here, I think, about two years ago at a, at a meeting 
uh, or I guess I'm not at Will Seda technically, we're not on the campus technically, but uh, I recall what a beautiful campus it was and it's a, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here to talk with such a uh, distinguished group. The, uh, the project that we're working on is looking at the changes both in, in the U.S. happening in the energy sector, which are profound, uh, but also the change that are happening in terms of Asia's uh, energy supplies, energy security, dependence on the Middle East uh, oil supplies, uh, and trying to put those two together and see what the geopolitical implications uh, of those very, very large shifts in uh, global oil and LNG flows and what the implications are for this map. What, what the implications are for Asia's uh, energy security. So let me kind of go through a, just a brief overview of what, uh, of what we're doing. The new hydraulic fracturing uh, technology that has uh, been so prominent in the U.S. Uh, has l literally uh, led to an enormous boom in U.S. oil and gas production, a, a, a huge reversal in uh, the historic decline in U.S. oil and gas production. At the same time, the U.S. had been Uh, at the same time, the U.S. has been the largest uh, oil exporter, uh, oil importer in the world, which has driven its strategic interest, or at least been a critical element of its strategic interest in the Persian Gulf stability, uh, alliances, uh, and a series of very costly uh, interventions, both in terms of lives and, 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 and dollars. Uh, the U.S. has been driven by an energy scarcity narrative that's uh, been, been the case since 1917 in the first oil shock. But with the change in U.S. oil and gas production, uh, this narrative of scarcity has become uh, a narrative of energy abundance. And so this is gradually leading to a change in perceptions uh, of, of energy security uh, in the U.S. Now, it, it ultimately, this is good for Asia. Uh, and for Japan, because it means a lot more oil, uh, a lot more LNG on the global market, and that's good for Asia and Japan's energy security. But there is a potential downside, and that is that the question of will the U.S. be willing to continue its long traditional role of stabilizing the Persian Gulf, uh, securing the sea lanes, uh, at a time when virtually all of those exports from the Persian Gulf are coming to Asia increasingly uh, rather than the U.S. And, and moreover, uh, the question is, what can Asia do to contribute uh, more greatly to its own energy security and the flow of that oil and gas from the Middle East to Asia? So the study is talking about looking at it would be prudent for the U.S., Japan, uh, and the rest of Asia to be thinking about a future energy security architecture which takes into account these big changes in U.S. perceptions, uh, willingness to carry this load and, and also takes into account the, the big change in, in Asian dependence on Middle East oil and LNG. So let me go through some of the, some of the pieces of that. U.S. oil production has risen uh, by an amount that's really uh, hard, to, hard to overstate. Uh, production has increased by over 3 million barrels a day since 2008. And if you think about that, that's equivalent to adding another Iraq to world oil production. So these are really very large numbers. And as a result, the U.S. oil imports are declining uh, very rapidly. Uh, we've gone from depending on imports of 60% of our oil supplies uh, in 2007. Today it's less than 30%, and over the next 10 or 15 years, that's likely to head towards 10% and, and possibly perhaps even less. So our dependence on imported oil is declining, in particular our dependence on uh, barrels from the Middle East. And if you add together U.S. oil production and Canadian oil production, and think about the U.S. North America market as one single market, uh, by 2018 North America itself will be essentially uh, oil self-sufficient. So we've had a really profound change in the overall balance of the North America uh, oil picture. And this is beginning to percolate through uh, to thinking in Washington, D.C. about our energy security, our posture in the Middle East, our commitments to these uh, very costly uh, commitments historically in the East. 
Now, if you turn to the question of natural gas, we've had a similar jump in production. And in fact, it's even been even larger in terms of scale. Uh, just to give you some perspective, since in the last five years, the U.S. production of natural gas, shale natural gas, has risen by an amount equal on annual production, equal to two times Japan's annual natural gas consumption. Now, this is just the increase that's happened in just five years. So this is an enormous scale of shale gas production increase. Uh, and everything suggests that that's going to continue to grow very dramatically, uh, probably for the next 10 years and possibly the next 20 years. So again, on the, on the gas side, five years ago, uh, we all thought that the U.S. would become a very large importer of natural gas, LNG, and, and frankly, ultimately a competitor for LNG suppliers with Japan. But instead, we're headed rapidly for self-sufficiency in natural gas. And as many of you, I'm sure, know, we will be exporting LNG uh, to Asia. Five projects, six projects have been approved in the last uh, two years to export LNG from the U.S. to non-FTA countries. Obviously, that can come to Japan. That's the equivalent of about 50 million tons a year of LNG that's been approved for exports now. Uh, and I think the, US, the, the Japanese LNG market today is about 88 million tons. So these are, again, very large numbers of LNG exports from the U.S. So this, this change on the U.S. side, both on oil and gas, is, is having a very profound effect on, on the perceptions in the U.S. about what we need to do for our energy security. Contrast that against uh, uh, the, the Asian side. We've had, on the Asian side, this enormous shift in the whole fulcrum of global oil trade. Instead of from the Middle East to primarily North America, Europe, and elsewhere, uh, there's been a huge shift west to east so that 80% of Middle East oil exports, for example, are going to Asia today. Very few of those sales come to North America at all. Uh, the balance tends to go to Europe. So there's a huge shift as oil demand has grown in uh, India, China, uh, across Southeast Asia. There's been a shift of 80% of global oil flows or Persian Gulf oil flows uh, now going to Asia. When you have China, for example, getting nearly 30% of its entire oil supply from the Middle East, and that's going to grow uh, probably more than double over the next 10 or 15 years. Uh, of course, Japan depends on the Middle East for 85 roughly 85% of its uh, oil supplies and roughly 30% of its LNG supplies. So at the one hand, you've had this growing self-sufficiency in North America. On the other hand, you've had a huge shift in the dependence of Asia, particularly uh, on Middle East oil. So uh, those two fundamental changes uh, suggest that the geopolitics of energy is changing very dramatically. Now, the foundations of U.S. involvement in the Persian Gulf in particular, there's a whole series of, of of reasons why the U.S. has been deeply engaged in the Middle East. Support for, for Israel, the war against terrorism, interest in stability across the region. But from an energy perspective, two things have, di have been driving. One is U.S. access to Middle East oil, and until recently we were a significant importer of Gulf oil, particularly from Saudi Arabia. Second is ensuring that those Gulf oil flows flow to the world oil market, uh, because the whole world economy depends on those incremental oil supplies. Uh, oil is a global market. Oil prices are priced in the global market. Any disruption in the Gulf affects the whole global economy, including uh, the U.S. So those two uh, uh, interests in terms of the energy uh, picture were what's driving us uh, in the Persian Gulf. But as I said, U.S. reliance on the Gulf is virtually disappearing. Um, and Asia's reliance on the Gulf continues uh, uh, to grow. So in some sense, you have to begin to take account of this uh, and ask the question, how long and under what conditions will the U.S. be willing to continue to carry this costly load of trying to stabilize the Persian Gulf, protect the sea lanes, when uh, the, the direct beneficiaries of that are virtually entirely Asia and increasingly uh, China. Uh, so in, as the U.S. becomes uh, a larger and larger natural gas exporter. So what can Asia do to contribute its share to this uh, changing uh, environment? And then you add to this some other non-energy considerations, which tend to drive the U.S. in, in the same direction. Uh, you 
have a deeply war-weary American public. And it's hard to overstate the impact of the two wars in Afghanistan and Iraq and the impact on the public's willingness to support further military uh, involvement in the Gulf. And you can see that uh, play out very well in, in Syria. Uh, some would call hegemony fatigue, I think, is, is what you might call uh, setting in for the U.S. Uh, the Arab Spring, I think, is reducing the ability of the U.S. to be able to shape events in the Middle East. Uh, yes, we still have the we're still dominant political power, but the entire shape of the conflict in the Middle East is changing, so it's very hard for us to be able to shape events in the same way uh, that we used to uh, in the past. Add to that serious budget constraints uh, affecting the defense budgets. Some very difficult choices are going to have to be made by the U.S. military uh, in a much tougher fiscal environment that the U.S. is facing uh, over the next decade. Uh, and finally, the U.S. Uh, rebalance to Asia requires resources. Uh, and, and we are very explicitly in an era of trying to reduce our commitments to the Middle East after the Iraq attack of Afghanistan war. Uh, we need those resources in part to help resource uh, the Asian rebalance that the U.S. wants to do. Now, at the same time, nevertheless, the U.S., Asia, uh, all of us still depend on Gulf stability. All of us still depend on the reliability of the flow of that oil uh, from the Persian Gulf to the global market. As I said, this is a global market. And from the U.S. perspective, Asia's prosperity is hinged directly to the free flow of that oil uh, and LNG from the Gulf. So uh, even the Asian rebalance for the U.S. is heavily contingent on continuing that reliable flow of oil and gas uh, from the Persian Gulf to Asia, even if no barrels come to the U.S. Uh, at all. So the study really is about what, what are the prospects for the U.S. to reducing its presence in the Gulf and to what extent will it do so? What will that look like? Uh, the, the most costly part of our involvement has been the boots on the ground, the efforts to stabilize the region, to keep the oil flowing, at least in, in the Gulf areas. Uh, protecting the sea lanes is something that's a little more, a uh, little easier to do in a sense, but, but trying to stabilize this nasty region uh, with boots on the ground has been the one that's been so costly and will be difficult to get public support to do that in the future. So how will we reduce our geopolitical footprint? We have lots of other interests in the region. Uh, how will Asia, Japan, China, others react to any reduced flow to the U.S. is going to be a critical region for Asian uh, energy security. Uh, how would the U.S. and Asia and Japan craft a new energy security architecture? Uh, particularly in the case where China is in a very different category of a strategic competitor as opposed to a strategic uh, ally of the U.S. What would a bargain look like amongst the key Asian players to play a bigger role in their own energy security? Uh, and as I said, what role would China play uh, in that? So I think to conclude, what we, we think it will be prudent for U.S., Japan, uh, the rest of Asia to be thinking about a new energy security architecture, markets, energy security institutions, geopolitical uh, efforts in, in the Persian Gulf to work together in a new architecture with where Asia makes a greater contribution to its own energy security, uh, where there's a partnership and leadership both from the U.S., uh, but also from Japan. And I think within that, strategically, what role does China play in that? China's going to be the biggest oil importer in the region, biggest oil importer in the world, uh, virtually as we speak today. What role will China play in that, that energy security architecture? So that's the overview. I'm going to just sit down and wait for each of your comments. My name is Shoi Tito. I'm a senior analyst at the Institute of Energy uh, uh, Economics, Japan. Uh, thank you very much for uh, making this uh, very kind introduction of me, and I'm so glad uh, to join this very um, timely and important event along with my old friend Mike. 
it not already easy to make additional follow ups after his very comprehensive uh, ex explanation of what is going on. But I'd like to um, uh, bring your attention to what energy security means in the context of US Japan alliance today, especially against the backdrop of the uh, shale gas revolution. Well, just like Mike, I'm also teaching um, university students in Tokyo once a week, and uh, I'm always telling my students, energy security is something you come across on a daily basis on mass media. But it's such a you know, very uh, intangible world. It can mean many things, right? Uh, politics matters, uh, economy matters, history matters. You, know, you also have to know dynamics of financial markets, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it's such a world of jigsaw puzzle. You can you know, put up as many pieces as you want. And uh, well, I'd like to uh, um, expand uh, your, your scopes uh, with regard to what we have to bear in mind uh, in terms of the U.S.-Japan alliance when we think about uh, you know, the possibility or you know, projection of the booming hydrocarbon um, well, production in North America. I also like to make some comment on the importance of uh, nuclear component in the bilateral uh, alliance. Well, actually, um, we tend to pay attention to only natural gas uh, against shale gas revolution as the factor that we all know bring both nations uh, in terms of increasing the bilateral trade. Yes, uh, because of our nuclear shutdown after Fukushima accident, uh, as everyone knows, uh, Japan's LNG uh, import increased, and uh, Japan is actually uh, purchasing the, the most expensive LNG in the world. And if we um, increase LNG import from the states, that will be such a big help. But we also have to uh, take into account of the very fact that apart from the price or pricing issues, the fact that we will be able to uh, import huge amount of LNG from the United States means a lot for the future of Japanese uh, energy security as a whole. As of today, Japan imports about 30% of LNG from the Middle East, 20% from Southeast Asia. If you have global map in your mind, what does it mean? You know, the, this shared line of communication are starting from the home street, cutting across America Straits all the way to South and East China Seas. These are the places, you know, we have uh, lots of geopolitical flash points. Well, Japanese uh, companies have already signed up a total sum of uh, about 17 million tons of energy if they all come, uh, come online in the next few, uh, you know, several years. It's already accounts for about 20% of last year's Japan's total energy imports. Well, we are also expecting arrival of LNG uh, supplies from Canada. And if you just put together all the possibilities we can find in North America, uh, in less than a decade, I think that Japan can reach, you know, um, receiving up to more than 30 or 35 percent of LNG coming from North America across the Pacific Ocean. Well, uh, and now in the U.S. Congress, uh, petitioners are starting to talk about lifting ban on crude oil exports. Yes, compared with natural gas, 
always more sensitive politically. And it's not very easy. But as a matter of fact, the U.S. has already uh, began to export massive amount of uh, petroleum products. That has actually reduced the impact of Chinese surging oil demand significantly. And coal is also important. We shouldn't forget about it. Well, some people say that coal is environmentally harmful. Well, the question is yes and no. Now, uh, since coal is losing a share in U.S. power mix, although it still accounts for more than 40% of power mix, uh, just because uh, natural gas is uh, decreasing its prices, uh, coal, U.S. coal needs to find new places to export. In fact, a massive amount of coal is being exported to not only to Europe but also to Asia, including China and uh, Japan. Uh, for the next two decades, well, um, Asia is projected to consume uh, more than 70 or 75 percent of global coal consumption, in which China will account for more than 60 percent, according to some estimates. Well, with arrival of massive coal supplies from North America, mainly the United States, it will reduce the impact of China's surging energy demand. Well, as I already noted, some people say that coal sounds really dirty for me, especially for uh, environmentalists or no, many NGOs. But we should forget the robust fact that we have so-called green coal technologies. It depends which technology we use, right? And we, we should know that Japan and U.S. are leaders of promoting diffusing green coal technologies. Well, due to the uh, length of time, I should hurry up um, no, wrapping my presentation. But before uh, going into conclusion, I also uh, make a, would like to make a note on the importance of nuclear as, a lin as one of linchpins of the US-Japan alliance. Well, earlier today, uh, when I was Mr. Kono, made a note that well, in the long run, Japan may phase out nuclear power uh, generation. Well, wait a minute, I have to say it. Well, <laughs> this particular question goes far beyond Japan's domestic issues. Japan and the U.S. are already inseparable uh, twin brothers in nuclear twins, as witnessed Hitachi GE and Toshiba Westinghouse uh, joint ventures. Japanese vendors made up for the loss of uh, international competitiveness of U.S. nuclear industry for the last more than three decades after Three Miles Island incident back in uh, 1979. And in case Japan is able to step out of you know, this nuclear industry, the, the impact upon the U.S. nuclear industry will be so significant. In other words, without Japan's proactive uh, commitment in the U.S.-Japan nuclear you know, industry alliance, uh, it will be harder for the United States to maintain its stakes in the global nuclear market and well it has uh you know the question had to do with you know the issues just beyond energy issues per se right uh, as everyone knows japan has been uh 
said to be promoter of non-proliferation regime. Right? So in case US loses its stakes in global nuclear markets, uh, not only Japan, but also US will uh, decrease its voices. Well, China is increasing uh, construction of nuclear reactors rapidly. Uh, they have, well, as of today, I think they have 18 and 19 reactors. I'm sorry if I'm wrong. But they have about 30 reactors in construction, another 50 under planning. Some experts say that China will uh, have up to 100 nuclear reactors by 2030. It may be wrong, but uh, if we know uh, how much China needs to uh, sustain its energy needs, they have to do everything, including nuclear reactors. Well, in case Japan and the US uh, lose uh, presence in uh, the nuclear market of emerging economies, including China, India, and everywhere else, who will be responsible for the future direction of non-proliferation regime? And maybe I talk more than 10 minutes, but let me stop here at once. Thank you very much for your attention. Soichi and Mike for a tremendous presentation of the issues. Um, before we open up for questions from the floor, I wanted to ask Mike if he could um, provide some expansion on a point that Soichi raised um, when he was talking about the tremendous impact that the shale revolution in the U.S. has had on a whole range of energy markets, including potentially oil uh, and coal. Um, if you could provide some context on the policy debate that's taking place in the U.S. right now about what kind of an energy relationship we're going to have with Asia uh, and what the implications of that are for our relationships in the region. And, and by that, I mean specifically debates over whether or not we should be restricting exports of gas or coal or oil. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the whole, the whole context of uh, oil or gas exports for the U.S. is set up in the context of the 73, 74 oil shock uh, and 79, uh, 80 oil shocks. And so essentially uh, any export of LNG or natural gas uh, to any country that's not an FTA country, which is really all but one big consumer of LNG is not an FTA country, is requires approval from the Department of Energy. Crude oil exports are essentially banned uh, except in rare circumstances and mostly just it's allowed to Canada as part of the North American Free Trade Agreement, but otherwise uh, exports of crude oil are essentially banned. At the same time, you can export products of oil, you know, gasoline, diesel fuel, all those things can be exported freely. So you have, and, and in natural gas, you can export propane, the liquid gas molecules, but you can't export gas, natural gas as LNG. So you have a you have a real uh, alphabet soup of, of, of restraints here uh, and, and real inconsistency, especially on the oil side when you can export product and, and but not export crude. So there's a huge business now of buying relatively low-priced U.S. crude in the mid-continent where it's kind of bottled up both because of pipelines and the export ban on crude, refining it into oil products uh, and selling it into international markets at Brent base prices that, and a lot of refiners are really making a killing at doing this. Uh, so I you've got a really inconsistent uh, set of policy frameworks. I think the changes in production, uh, we have finally begun to overcome resistance to exports of LNG uh, or natural gas. There's tremendous domestic resistance both from domestic industry that wanted to kind of bottle up that natural gas because we have extraordinarily low natural gas prices in the U.S. gives our industry a tremendous competitive advantage. So there's a fear amongst some domestic chemical industries and others that if we allow exports of natural gas, that will drive up the price of natural gas in the U.S. and we'll lose some of those advantages. Uh, that's essentially a, a, a protectionist uh, argument. 
And for the most part, we've begun to overcome that with the five or six projects that have been approved. Uh, and there's another 12 or 14 projects in line to be approved. And so I think that's going to move forward. Uh, we've overcome that. And surprisingly enough, there is now beginning to be discussion about exports of crude oil. There was a hearing in Congress just uh, last week or the week before uh, yeah, about exporting, you know, the merits of exporting crude oil. And as you would expect, domestic interests that benefit from low-priced crude that's bottled up by the crude export ban uh, are showed up in, in mass for the hearing, uh, saying that if you allow exports of crude oil, it will drive up the price of, of uh, gasoline and jet fuel in the U.S. and harm U.S. consumers, with the domestic oil producers saying, how long are you going to milk the U.S. domestic oil industry by forcing us to bottle up our crude here and sell it for discounted prices relative to what it's really worth? So I think it will be a while before we really have a serious uh, consideration of crude oil exports. That's going to be a very tough battle. The whole narrative of scarcity is so deeply embedded in the energy security psyche of the U.S. Congress in particular, uh, that uh, they're, they're going to have to relearn, in a sense, a whole new energy narrative uh, before they're really going to seriously consider that. I think there'll be exceptions now granted for some crude oil exports that can be done administratively by the Commerce Department and by the White House, but not a, not a broad scale uh, uh, opening up of the taps of crude oil exports anytime soon. But I think the message is it's being discussed. And much more rapidly than many of us expected this to be, to, to rise to, to a point on the national agenda in the U.S., I think all of us thought this was going to take several years. But in fact, this issue is coming at us very quickly. I just joined a, a small task force of, of folks uh, in Washington, D.C., who over the next two months will be working through the, all the issues related to crude oil exports. And that advice will be going to Congress and elsewhere. So that tells you how fast this uh, this issue is moving at us, and something about the gradual change in the narrative uh, in Washington, D.C., about its energy security dilemma. Um, so, Chief, did you want to add to that? And I'm particularly interested in your thoughts. You mentioned the importance of energy in the U.S.-Japan alliance. It, what impact this debate might have on other facets of U.S.-Japan cooperation, if any? Well, I, I guess you would say that, surprisingly, when we just start Energy issues used to be under focus in the bilateral framework. Actually, uh, up until recently, nuclear is the main component of U.S. Japan energy cooperation issues. But just as you know, we are talking about the impact of shale resolution here today. Now, the possibility of uh, expanding cooperation in the field of energy is really rapidly expanding. One thing I forgot to mention in my presentation is the point that I think Japan and U the United States should revisit the importance of Alaska. Alaska is located at the big head of U.S. Asia policy. Alaska has virtually lost domestic market for LNG supplies because it's a lower cost route, which is costly than the shale gas production. Alaska needs new investment. Many Japanese actually don't know that. Alaska was the very first place to export LNG to this country back in 1969. Well, earlier today, uh, we talked about the future of the Middle East, what Japan can do. Yes, Japan sh should increase its effort to be committed in the political stability of the Middle East. Japan should find its new roles uh, in the, you know, the safety of sea levels of communication. And I believe Japan will do more in a sense or another. But uh, in reality, what Japan can do in security dimension is limited, right? 
the over projected role of Japan may trigger unnecessary concerns geopolitically. But now we have such a tremendous opportunity in Alaska where Japan will be able to show its flag you know, in the context of energy security and to answer what Japan can do for the alliance. Um, we'll open up for questions from the floor. Um, if I could just ask uh, for you to introduce yourselves first. Um, in the back. Thank you. Um, I'm Matsumi of a Japanese company called Itoshi Corporation. Uh, the two brief comments about uh, uh, asking your opinion about U.S.-Japan energy cooperation. Uh, number one, the, there's no question whatsoever about the rosy picture of U.S. energy outlook. However, outside the United States, there will continue to be unstable, unstable, and uncertain energy outlook uh, for many reasons, including you know, increasing demand in developing countries. Also, geopolitical instability and uncertain, uncertainty will probably continue, and that would affect hugely energy outlook. Therefore, under such circumstances, Japan, in my view, needs U.S.-Japan energy collaboration. Why? In order to maintain vibrant economy and industry, and in order to stay as reliable partner of the United States. Second comment about the relative to nuclear energy, the, we should be worried about the monopoly of nuclear reactors by Russia and China, as well as an issue of non-proliferation. If Japan continued to shut down and reduce the nuclear power plants, that important issue also should be a part of U.S.-Japan energy co cooperation. So, for two uh, those uh, you know uh, reasons, I uh, strongly. Uh, argue for a stronger U.S.-Japan energy cooperation. But this is Japanese logic. Is the United States receptive to U.S.-Japan energy cooperation? I would appreciate your view. Thank you. And some questions. I, uh, y you know, that's, that's a good question. Many of us, and I think this is what you were getting at earlier, Meredith, uh, in the debate over should the U.S. be exporting LNG and exporting LNG to Japan in particular, have argued that this would be a key, should be a key component of our conception of the U.S.-Japan alliance, uh, and, that, and the notion that the U.S. would not export LNG to Japan over this technical issue of free trade agreement uh, struck most of us as just absurd. But you have to remember there was tremendous resistance in the U.S., not on the grounds of strategic issues, but for very narrow, I, I would argue, parochial interests of bottling this LNG up or gas up domestically. And, and frankly, there's also uh, a strong environmental resistance in the U.S. Uh, to LNG exports that's rooted in the environmental community, many uh, feeling that this simply encourages fracking, uh, the development of fracking technology, expansion of fracking, which many in the community think is fundamentally environmentally unsound. So. There's been tremendous resistance on that side as well. Uh, but I think from the strategic community, the foreign policy community, there's a real strong consensus that this, this is vital for the U.S.-Japan alliance. Add to that, I've also heard uh, anecdotally um, from members of Congress and their staff how helpful it's been to hear from Japanese interlocutors about Japan's overall security interests and outlook. So that dialogue is a very important part, I think, of how U.S. policy um, evolved in this regard. So, Uchi, did you want to comment on either of those two comments, particularly the, the nuclear issue? So I think we're in agreement. Well, I, I actually was on here with, with uh, you know, me on the importance of the nuclear cooperation in the Barata Alliance. So once again, uh, Japan's, uh, if Japan is able uh, significantly reduce its commitment in nuclear 
uh, yeah, industry. I have to say it should be it's got cost a great film quality by a lot of bad corporations. That way there's no way back. Because you know, we are already paying Broadway. If you add the fans active commission, it it jeopardize US management of global non proliferation regime as well. I saw a couple of hands up earlier, so maybe we'll collect a couple of questions since we're coming towards the end we ha of the time we have for this session. Um, right there in the center. Um, yeah, I've introduced myself already. Uh, uh, I have a question for Ito-sensei uh, about um, coal, clean coal technology specifically. Uh, this is very naive, so could you just give me some numbers uh, about or, or, or a sense of how clean coal tech compares to regular uh, coal thermal power plants in terms of emissions per megawatt hour and cost per megawatt hour. Um, also, um, is there a domestic market for, for this technology? So are Japanese makers selling these power plants to Japanese electricity utilities, yes or no? And lastly, is Japan able to buy coal freely from the uh, United States? Maybe Mr. Herbert can, can elucidate that better. Um, Suichi, before you answer, I just want to see if anyone else would like to ask a question. Yes, sir. Um, also, I would like to ask you, uh, uh, Ito-san, is that the uh, future of the nuclear plant, uh, it seems to me that uh, the price, you know, that uh, more strict uh, regulation on the construction of the nuclear power, so that the United States is uh, not so willing to build the new power station. So that uh, my <laughs> perception of the future of the nuclear plant is uh, reducing in both the United States and Japan. Uh, you know, that the United States has automated energy sources. Uh, you're talking about the security of the putting, but uh, if we can have uh, some kind of international uh, you know, regulation such as Urenco is uh, the provide to so those you know the uh, country you know that uh, including North uh, South Korea and Japan and so it seems to me uh, the uh, international regime where we can maintain such kind of you know, you know uh, nuclear security. How do you think? Thank you. First, to the call question. You know, when I'm speaking, I don't have a precise number. I don't have an extra seat in my uh, brain uh, today. But uh, I have to say that it depends on, you know, when we talk about the clean coal technology, you know, you know, people tend to talk about CCS, et cetera. But what I especially mean in the industry, that is the decision or availability of, of more efficient use of coal-based combustion, right? Uh, we have a super typical uh, uh, coal solar plant, ultra plus advanced ultra super typical power plant, etc. So we cannot overgeneralize. So we have to you know, make all sorts of categories, which plants could be uh, environmentally cleaner than the others. And well, in terms of with regard to the question or question whether Japan can uh, import, you know, well, well, coal from the state in a cleaner way, it, it is actually U.S. domestic policy. But as far as I know, the State Department has already decided that you, you know the state is willing to export more coal to the nation where clean coal technologies are deployed. So my message is Tokyo and Washington can collaborate to think about how we can expand, especially Asia's regional clean coal market in future one. Uh, with regard to the nuclear question, yes, it is right. Uh, it is getting tougher and tougher to build new nuclear power plants in the state. It's a good point. 
uh, we shouldn't forget about two factors. Number one, the Navy states still has more than 100 reactors in operation. Number two, it's really impossible for the United States to face a nuclear power for political reasons, security reasons. Yet, uh, as the global superpower with nuclear weapons, I don't think U.S. will ever, ever make a you know, decision to face a nuclear uh, violation. Otherwise, uh, once again, the U.S. will lose you know, commitment in, in the global non-proliferation regime and arms control. So we have to consider both business or economic uh, you know, background and political reality at the same time. Um, Mike, do you want to answer the question about coal exports from the U.S.? Uh, well, you, you, there's no constraint, uh, no legal constraint on coal exports from the U.S. Uh, the bottleneck is the ability to build, to expand port facilities and rail facilities to move that to the Pacific Coast. Tremendous amount of uh, local resistance, environment. You know, there's a huge debate, the environmental community arguing we're simply feeding, uh, you know, a dirty fuel to Asia. Uh, so that's the r that's the real constraint. Just on the efficiency issue, uh, I, th I tend to think about it as cleaner coal uh, technology. And so you, if you go from regular uh, pulverized coal combustion all the way up to ul ultra supercritical or advanced, uh, you're going from about 30% efficiency to about 50% efficiency. So for every ton of coal you pump through that plant, you're getting 40% more uh, kilowatts out of that. Uh, so that's that's where you get the real bang for your buck in terms of uh, efficiency and cleaner uh, use of coal. Thank you. Unfortunately, we've come to uh, the end of our allotted time for this session. So please join me in thanking our panelists. Um, Uh, it's now my pleasure to introduce to you our closing speaker for today, uh, Admiral Dennis Blair. Admiral Blair um, is on the board of the National Bureau of Asian Research, so I've had the pleasure of working with him on a number of our initiatives, ranging from our work on energy security, the Pacific Energy Summit, an annual event that we hold looking at energy and environmental challenges in the region, um, to co-chairing uh, a com high-level commission uh, last year on the theft of American intellectual property. Uh, he was the former director of national intelligence for President Obama. He has had a long and distinguished career in public service in the United States as a naval officer, uh, including as commander in chief of the US Pacific Command. Uh, he knows Asia very well um, through his career in the Navy and his work at DNI um, and has lived and traveled throughout the region, um, including here in Japan. Um, he is also on the board of Secure America's Future Energy, which is a nonprofit, uh, which recently released a report um, by on the Commission on Energy and Geopolitics looking at oil security 2025, which is an assessment of the foreign policy and national security implications of North America's energy abundance. Um, we've asked Admiral Blair to close out our program today uh, drawing on his deep expertise of Asia as well as uh, the U.S. national security outlook. And uh, please join me in welcoming him to the stage. Thank you, Admiral Blair. Well, thanks, Meredith. My job is to generate some sympathy for the students of Waseda, so I would like each of you to write down the chemical formula for natural gas, for propane, and for methane. Pass it to the right, and we'll collect it. Just kidding. We'll just <laughs> do that. But it is good to be back in, uh, in Tokyo on this very important topic. If you listen just to television commentators on the implications of the uh, domestic oil and gas abundance in the United States, you would hear 
experts saying that we can neglect the Middle East, that we can simply walk, aw walk away from it. Uh, however, serious academic and think tank research is going on now on this subject, and the answers are becoming quite different. In addition to this uh, study that Michael Herberg is heading for the National Bureau of Asian Research, I was co-chair of a study by the uh, nonprofit Securing America's Future Energy. We released a report about a month ago. About a week ago, the Center for the New American Security released a report on the same subject. Uh, Center for Security and International Studies, CSIS, has an ongoing study. So does Harvard. So there is serious uh, academic and policy research on this uh, question. And I will uh, tell you some of the emerging, uh, some of the emerging results that are coming out of this serious, uh, serious look at it. Uh, we've talked quite a bit about the natural gas uh, domestic uh, increases in the United States. And I think the implications of those are fairly easy to understand, both in terms of the economic benefit for the United States, but also some of the alliance uh, be benefits that will uh, flow from that. I'd like to talk in a little bit more detail about oil uh, as a separate uh, as a separate commodity with a separate set of issues. Uh, as as we know, oil price is set on an international uh, market, and that makes all the difference from natural gas and from and from others. In our study, and in most other studies, we looked ahead at many different alternatives for supply increases on the one hand, demand increases or decreases on the other hand, and the price balance there. And across virtually all uh, scenarios that you see, the balance between demand and supply will be pretty tight, and the price will remain fairly high. Uh, the most optimistic scenario that I've ever seen would be that the price of oil might come down to $85 a barrel and that the spare capacity in the world system might grow as much as 4 million barrels per day. But that's an optimistic projection. Most projections would show a price more in the 110 barrels, $110 per barrel and a spare capacity in the global market of something more like uh, 3 million barrels per day or 2.5 million barrels per day. If that is the energy future, then the spare capacity in the world oil market, the swing producers all remain in the Middle East, almost all Saudi Arabia, potentially Iraq, if Iraq can solve some of its political problems and exploit its oil. But the Middle East remains the key to the world oil market and its ability to react to supply interruptions with the price spikes that come from those interruptions. So the question for the United States is not simply maintaining stability in the Middle East so that our alliance partners, Japan, Europe, can benefit from stable oil prices, but price shocks, supply interruptions affect the United States. That was the case in 73, that was the case in 1980. Uh, it, the case most recently in 2011, when the supply interruption from Libya, which was only one and a half, 1.6 million barrels per day, caused oil price increases in the United States and actually derailed the American recovery from the 2008 recession. So we have a vested security interest, an economic security interest in the Middle East that is very direct and will continue to be so in the future. And on top of that, the other American interests which have been mentioned, the security of Israel and other friends in the, in the region, our interest in dealing with terrorism, much of which comes out of Muslim extremist organization in that region, and our interest in containing nuclear proliferation in which events in Iran and in other countries in the Middle East who can be fed with Pakistan-based nuclear technology 
uh, remains. So in answer to one of the questions that uh, has been raised this morning, it is very difficult to see that the United States could withdraw from many responsibilities in the, in the Middle East. When you look at the actions that the United States could take in order to bring a more secure and beneficial energy future in the oil sector, our study really came up with four, and let me talk about those quickly. Uh, the first set of, set of them is domestic. The primary reason for the vulnerability of the American economy to oil price shocks is the heavy dependence in the transportation sector on oil. That's where we use about 75% of oil consumption. The transportation sector, cars, trucks, rail, aviation, is right now 93% dependent on petroleum. In 1973, it was 95% dependent on petroleum. We've only made a little, little progress. And so one of the imperatives for the United States is to diversify our fuel sources for transportation. The only two feasible alternatives are natural gas, which is feasible for heavy duty trucks and for fleets of heavy vehicles that are sent geographically centered in a city or in an area. And the other alternative is electricity for light trucks and for, for cars. Market forces will probably not produce dramatic changes. And so we believe that there must be government action, public-private partnerships in order to move to a more diverse set of transportation fuel. So that's recommendation number one. Recommendation two, in the Mideast, as I said, the United States will still be involved in a vital way in that area, but we think we can do so in a much more, uh, a much better way than we have in the past. Uh, when I came into the Navy, the only armed forces that we had in the Middle East were three ships and a one-star admiral. It was a very efficient military presence in the Middle East. Gas was about 25 cents a gallon. Life was good. Uh, beginning with the first Gulf War, we have seen a very steady increase of American military commitment in the region. And our policy has become much too dependent on military tools, much too dependent on intelligence tools, and a more sophisticated diplomatic and strategic approach has really been pushed to the, to the background. The withdrawal of our heavy combat units from Iraq a couple of years ago from Afghanistan this year offers us the opportunity to rebalance our strategy so it will not be so dependent on heavy military uh, commitments. The nature of the threat in the region also reinforces this. The threats in the Middle East to oil producing countries are not cross-border inv cross invasions anymore. They're almost entirely internal. The tensions of religious differences, of ethnic differences, of tribal differences, the tension between autocratic governments on the one hand and unequal citizens on the, on the other hand. These solutions to these problems are not huge military deployments by the United States or by any other other country. They have to do with more subtle forms of carrots, sticks, assistance, and incentives from many countries, the United States, Japan, Europe, those countries that uh, believe in democratic values and believe that the ultimate form of stability is to bring the rule of law and eventually democratic governance to these, these countries. So for the long term, we need to deal with these autocratic oil producing countries in the Middle East and, and elsewhere by gradually helping them become more stable and resilient, resilient from a societal point, point of view. And in the meantime, we need to have provision for dealing with potential cross-border invasion or with straits to places like the Strait of Hormuz 
But this can be done with a relatively light military footprint forward and forces available that can be brought to bear when they have to be, and those should be international forces. And we think that not only countries like the United States, Japan, and Europe have a stake in this sort of a policy in the Middle East, but that we can also involve China. Now, China would not be too enthusiastic about the democratic component of what I described, but they like the rule of law and the orderly component of it, and that's a good start for me. So that, that would be the Middle East piece. Uh, on, the, on the global governance of the oil market piece, there's also a great deal that we can do, and Japan and the United States can, pay, can play a key role uh, here. We are not very well postured internationally to deal with price spikes caused by supply interruptions. We had our most recent example in 2011. It was a Japanese director general of the IEA who orchestrated a strategic petroleum reserve release in order to deal with the economic consequences of the, Iranian, of the uh, Libyan revolution. But as he told us yesterday when we when we talked to Okudasan, it took a long time to put that together. Economic damage had been done before the releases were made or were, or were an announced, and the international system was slow in reacting to events which were very quick on the ground. So we need to improve our, con our consultation, uh, and we need to bring China and India, both big consumers, both with growing strategic petroleum reserves into the IEA system in order to be able to operate quickly. We need together to put pressure on consuming and producing countries to do away with interference in the flow of uh, market forces in the oil market. Subsidies to uh, petroleum use in countries uh, need to be gradually phased out. Saudi Arabia, for instance, uh, produces more oil than it ever did before, but it exports about the same as it did 10 years ago. Why? Because Saudi Arabian inefficient use of, inefficient use of oil has grown over, over time. Many other countries have sus subsidies to keep the price of uh, petroleum products uh, down. So there needs to be cooperation on getting the most out of the oil that we have in the international market. Finally, we need international cooperation in the protection of the production, the transmission, and the refining of, uh, of petroleum and its carrying across seaways. We've seen cyber attacks on Aramco in Saudi Arabia. We've seen physical attacks in Algeria on a natural gas facility. We've seen threats of mining of Strait of Hormuz to uh, by, by Iran, and this must be an international response in order to deal with these threats. So this whole area of, of the really global governance of the oil market needs to be improved, and Japan and the United States as the two largest uh, national and democratic uh, oil consuming countries need to work together to, to uh, lead, this, uh, lead this effort. So in, in summary, I think that a consensus is developing that American oil and gas abundance offers an opportunity to improve both the economic security and the national security of the United States and, it, and its allies, but it's not, a, it's not a golden key. It's not something that will instantly change the situation. It requires a series of very persistent, very careful, very integrated moves uh, and the United States and Japan working together can really play a key part in making these moves both to the benefit of their own countries and to many of our friends and allies around the world. So let me, uh, let me stop there, and I think we have a couple of minutes uh, for discussion there. Um, we do have some time for questions, um, and I'll open up the floor directly as, as we're coming towards the end of our program. And again, just ask that you identify yourselves first.
questions or comments from Nico? Yes, sir. Uh, hi, uh, Ren Crud. I work for uh, Conray Group. Uh, we're a clean tech importer and uh, marketing company. Um, Kono Sensei mentioned 50% uh, of the uh, the uh, energy issue in Japan will be solved by 2050, hopefully through um, uh, the reduction of uh, 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 sorry uh, energy efficiency and uh, and using things like LED light bulbs and whatnot. I'm uh, just wondering. Um, Regarding America's use of energy, um, clearly when there was a supply issue in the 70s um, and all through the 80s, um, uh, there was a, a reaction to, uh, to more energy efficient use uh, domestically in the USA. Um, now that, um, although it's not quite so simple, at least uh, in the media, for example, there's an abundance of energy. Are we going to, going to see a reaction, for example, against green tech or, um, or uh, towards a uh, less intelligent use of of, uh, of energy efficient products domestically in the U.S. Um, just simply saying, you know, if the if the supply is now greater, um, are people not going to worry so much about uh, about clean energy uh, and just use more or use uh, less wisely? The moment in the United States, we have sort of a virtual alliance between those of us who are primarily concerned about energy security which leads us to things like conservation, which leads us to things like diversification, and those whose primary concern is really environ environmental. Um, sometimes it doesn't work as well as it should. For example, in the current dispute over the Keystone Pipeline project to bring uh, oil from Canada down into the Uni United States, the energy facts of the matter are that that pipeline will make no difference in overall environmental degradation in, in North America or in, or in the world. The primary uh, source of, of pollution of fossil products is when they're used, when they're put through the engine of a car or they're put through a, a fuel, fuel plant. And so if you're interested in Minimizing the environmental effects, you should use less fossil fuel, which would mean more energy security and so on. So I think there's, I think there's sort of a, when we think about it, a, an alliance between those whose concern is primarily environmental, those whose concern is primarily uh, security, and w I think we see that playing out. So I'm optimistic that we, that we won't go back to the days of uh, turning on our fireplaces and turning on our air conditioning <laughs> at, the <laughs> at the same time. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Shimano Senga. I'm from the Romanian Embassy here in Tokyo. Uh, I have a question. You spoke about China and India uh, and becoming more involved in uh, ensuring uh, security of energy. Uh, how about Russia and the Russian Federation? Because given the uh, US energy market and uh, Russia is has been so far a very big player on the energy market for Europe and for part of Asia. And right now its role is diminishing. How do you see uh, it actioning in the future? Thank you very much. We have had a difficult time bringing Russia in, an act in a positive role into the, uh, into the energy picture, frankly. Uh, because the Russian economy has become so uh, gas and oil export dependent for its uh, economic, economic well-being, they tend to take a very narrow, narrow approach to energy questions. And the, the question they ask is, what will make the most money for Russia? Uh, and when you have that attitude, it's sort of hard to, <laughs> it's hard to bring them into a positive role. Uh, they've not been very helpful from a military point of view in terms of a common commitment to uh, keeping the sea lanes open and protecting shipments. Uh, they've not been terribly, uh, terribly helpful in terms of uh, common approaches to uh, conservation or other things. So I, I think most of us are 
sort of waiting until some different uh, attitudes develop in Russia before we think we can uh, get them to help in this uh, in this space. Um, we have time for one last question. Yes, sir. Just talking about the spare capacity, uh, and, and or uh, that uh, recently that uh, that the United States tried to have a rapprochement with uh, uh, the Iran, and if Iran's oil production is started, uh, the spare capacity will rise. I mean, uh, that's the wrong question. But also, the white money. I mean, the U.S. is now restricted on the uh, Federal Reserve is now restricted on the money supply so that is a uh, mm, future i mean white oil price is going down you know and uh, this price is uh, that that you stay at least 85 dollars a bar but uh, it seems to me the price of the oil is going down thank you right well taking your questions in reverse order uh i agree the most uh most analyses show the price of oil going up, not going, not going down. I cited eighty-eight dollars a barrel as the most optimistic uh, 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 projection that, uh, that 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 I have seen. Uh, on Iran, um, if the agreement between the P five plus one and Iran goes through, uh, it will still be several years. Might might be as many as eight or ten years before the Iranian uh, oil production uh, facilities can be built up for them to become a significant contributor in the two or three million barrels per day area. They have a pretty dilapidated uh, oil, oil structure and it's unlikely that they will uh, welcome international companies who could raise production quickly. So I think Iran, if there is an agreement, will be a gradual contributor to the, uh, to the oil market, not a swing producer like Saudi, Saudi Arabia. Uh, the, other, um, the other factor that I think I didn't mention in my remarks that it's important is that uh, many oil producers uh, don't have an economic floor under their oil price, but they have a political floor uh, for exa and for example, Iran depends uh, heavily on oil revenues for its economy, and it wants a high price of uh, oil. Saudi Arabia, which we used to think of as a uh, of having a very low floor on its uh, price, is now a relatively high price. Some people say ninety dollars. Some people say even a hundred dollars. In order to uh, finance the uh, government government revenues, same is true true in Russia. So I think the um, I think the uh, the days of uh, really cheap oil producers who can freely move their production up and down in response to political or economic uh, events is probably over now, and things will move more slowly and more conservatively than they did in the past. Thank you very much. Um, Blair for closing out our, our program with your insights and I want to thank all of you for a very interesting set of questions um, and again thank our co-host uh, the U.S. Japan Research Institute and the Sasakawa Peace Foundation for supporting this research. Um, please join me in thanking Admiral Blair again for sharing his <laughs> insights.